To go back briefly to Kenneth Clark's civilization, um, it marked a quite specific moment, um, I think, and pulled together its contradictions in an extraordinary way. Um, we were presented with a patrician high cultural view of civilization, uh, but one that was popularized um, to a mass cultural audience um, by the latest developments in a, meeting, in a medium that was considered radically leveling, which was that of color television, or black and white television, but nonetheless. Um, it put a hegemonic canon of taste, a very elitist cultural, uh, elitist taste or view of culture in palatably personal terms. Um, and also we might want to remind ourselves, it was at the center of political events. They were filming in May 1968 in Paris, right near the demonstrations and the violence. Um, and they complained, actually, that that was getting in the way of their filming and the gas back, the, 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 the tear gas was making their eyes hurt and making it hard to, um, to breathe. So in other words, they were rendering those important events invisible. They could have recorded them. That wasn't in the script. Okay, it was good television. Um, it was genial and confident, uh, but with a message that seemed strangely, if pleasantly and palatably, elitist. It was exclusionary. It was a little bit smug. And as the events in Paris show us, they were looking in the wrong direction. And they were quite literally holding their nose. For these reasons, I think it's quite understandable that it quickly became an object of critique. And um, John Berger, Berger's critique um, took on that challenge. Um, it was useful in that sense. It was effective. And I think that um, John Berger's critique has to be understood um, as important in that way, as Adrian said. Although I'm fascinated by the way Adrian is seeing how that began to close things down, whereas there are things that were that can be opened up in the Clark series. Okay, but what we're looking at here is the intersection of media and high culture at the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s. And it's something that had been looked at and a critique of it had been articulated in the French context by some of the things that Hannah has just shown us, uh, but also by Barthes' Mythologies, published in 1957. Um, although that didn't thematize the issue of television as much as the print media. Um, in the German context, which is my own area of research, uh, one might look to Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, um, which um, also thematized, well, radio, but mostly the print media. No, radio every bit as much. Um, but wasn't actually being read terribly much in Germany at the time. So it didn't really form the focus of a large-scale critique until about that moment or a little bit later. But I, I think its moment was yet to come then. Um, Berger also had a sharper focus on the issue of gender and, and certainly media. Um, but I was trying to think about how the intersection of media and high culture um, was thought about um, analyzed and criticized in Germany at the time. Um, as it turns out, I think that Kenneth Clark's series um, didn't make much of an impression in Germany. I don't know exactly when it was shown, but probably a year or two later. Um, it was seen as relatively harmless, I think. I began to ask how, cult how critique was developed um, in the German context, and I began to wonder why this happened so very differently. So what I'm going to present to you is not a paper with a specific argument, but just some reflections and a look at a case study, reflections on how the German situation was very, very different. Now, as historians, we're used to local specificity, uh, but the differences of how these critiques of hegemonic notions of culture and how they were mediatized, they are so different that I think they still can surprise us. <coughs> okay, so first of all, the... Um, the vocabulary doesn't match, doesn't work. Um, civilization, um, as something that one might want to criticize, 
um, probably wouldn't happen in the German context, or that wouldn't make sense in the German context, because of a long tradition of German cultural thought um, that actually had denigrated civilization. Civilization was considered those material aspects of modernity um, and technology that a lot of people um, found soulless and alienating. These are thinkers of culture in Germany in the, 18th, in the 19th and 20th centuries. They proposed instead something they called Kultur or culture, um, which rejected those aspects of civilization in terms of deeper values, more spiritual values. Um, they essentially set up um, a typology that contrasted civilization and culture as contrasting the alienated capitalist present and the alienated modern present with a pre-modern, pre-capitalist, unalienated existence. So in that sense, speaking very positively about civilization in the German context might actually have been somewhat subversive. Now, we shouldn't also criticize the notions of culture too much because they too had their own complexities. Um, culture as something that represents the very highest values of the European tradition um, had its own um, positive valence um, and liberating valence in a way. And it did so in the 19th century for the German bourgeoisie. The German bourgeoisie was politically disenfranchised and found actually in the areas of culture or the social areas defined as culture an area in which they could um, assert some sort of power, some sort of control. This has a lot to do with the tense and complex relationship between the bourgeoisie and the state in Germany at the time. So though culture came to be something that was in instrumentalized in, um, by reactionary forces, we can say, in the First World War and the Second World War, um, it was still quite a fraught term with many different possibilities, all of which had been compressed um, into quite a short period of time. So all of these terms would have been debated in much different ways in Germany had they been debated on the basis of um, a television series like Civilization. Okay, completely different and quite complex situation. So it occurred to me that it would be most helpful to focus on a case study, a particular event where the reactionary seemed to stand against the liberating or the progressive, and in any case, high culture stood against um, something like its mediatization um, or popularization. And that event was a revolt, in a way, a scandal um, that occurred in the Association of Art Historians Germany, their conference, in April of 1970. That was the Deutsche Kunsthistoriker Tag. Um, that was in Cologne. And there, a young scholar named Martin Warnke, whom we see on the left, um, held a session called The Work of Art Between Scholarship and Worldview. And I think it's called Between Scholarship and Worldview because there's a satisfying alliteration in German, otherwise it might have been between scholarship and ideology. Now there, he didn't actually attack an elitist view of culture, but rather this specific German situation, a critique of the discipline of art history itself and its deep implication in his country's national socialist past. Okay, a little bit of prehistory. Um, the student movement in <coughs> Germany was a, um, a, a very vital and a very prominent and a very public um, matter. Um, they were protesting against um, the Western involvement in Vietnam, in Iran, against German, West German rearmament, um, but also addressing crucial issues of university reform. Um, horrible things were happening in the universities. Uh, they were about to introduce time limits for how long students could hang around there and study before actually producing something that would be given some sort of diploma. Um, but not to make too light of it, funding was being cut and students were objecting to the fact that they had absolutely no representation in terms of bureaucratic, administrative, or curricular matters. Um, 
But the situation of the art historians and people like Martin Varnke was somewhat different from the student movement. We can't simply allied um, the young generation of art historians that he represented and who spoke in Cologne with the student movement into some broad sense of a new left or progressive forces. The conditions that the art historians were responding to, people like Martin Varnke, were the conditions of what we would now call early career academics. And their situation was quite dire. Um, People who didn't have a chair in the history of art, in other words, anyone below a full professor, um, really had very little pay at all and was expected to hang around until they somehow, some time, finally got the call to a proper chair. Um, at the in the museums, the situation was similar. Until they got a proper curating job, and in fact the people who did most of the work there were expected to work more or less for free as so-called volunteers who received a tiny amount of money. Now, it wasn't only the money that was the issue, but it was also the absolute power of museum directors and of the full professors, the so-called ordinarios, um, in history of art, um, who determined who would be hired and who wouldn't be hired, who also determined what could be published and what couldn't. In other words, they acted as censors to art historical scholarship in a quite powerful way. So the art historian, the young art historian in the 60s um, was completely dependent on a conservative generation, many of whom could be considered Nazis or certainly had questions to answer about their role in the university system at the time of National Socialism. Um, it was a closed, conservative world of patronage, grace, and favor, and it was described by people at the time as a pre-democratic situation. Now, to call something pre-democratic in Germany is interesting. West Germany was designed, in a way, to be a democratic state. Um, but democracy wasn't really something that had the commitment of a lot of people in the Federal Republic of Germany. It wasn't fundamentally, I think, a democratic place. There were a lot of pre-democratic or anti-democratic impulses, such as those we see in the way universities were run. And it's for this reason that Willy Brandt, when he became chancellor, when he ran for election um, in 1969, his platform was Mehr Demokratie Wagen. We have to gamble on a bit more democracy. That was very much um, a challenge still in the late 1960s. All right, so the university was a highly politicized place, not simply in the sense that there were a lot of people there who had strong political views and were willing to take action on them, but the whole terrain of higher education and the museums, similarly, um, w w was a completely complex, well, a very complex political matter. Okay, what happened in terms of the art historians was they founded an association called the Ulm Association, the Ulmer Verein, and this was particularly for early career um, art historians. So it wasn't part of the student movement, and for the first few years, students were not allowed to join. The association was formed after the Association of Art Historians, run by the established scholars, refused to put matters of curricular and professional reform on the agenda of their meeting in 1968. Okay, so again, not part of a broad student movement, but quite specific issues. But on to the event, because it was quite dramatic. Here are the signatures of the people founding the Ulm Association, and anyone who's involved in German art history would recognize the names of many of them. But the event itself, this conference session, and here I'm showing you how it was published later in 1970, so quite quickly, in fact. The young art historians wanted their own session. They wanted the session where they could decide what would be presented. They found out, actually, that the head of the Art Historical Association, Herbert von Einem, had refused permission to allow four academic papers to be delivered um, because they extended past the Goethezeit, past around the period of 1800. So we're still dealing with a profession and a set of people for whom the French Revolution represented somehow the end of culture, or what we would call the end of civilization. 
The elders agreed to allow this session to take place. Um, they went back on it, but it finally happened, but it happened at a time scheduled when other sessions uh, were also going on that would have been of interest to young art historians, but it was well attended. Okay, what was criticized by the six members of this session um, was the role of not art, but of the history of art in society. And not only its exclusivity, its distance from the real world, but quite specifically its implication in the National Socialist past and the extreme nationalism of the popularized forms of art history, all still into the 1960s. The first presentation, not the first presentation, but one of the most important of the presentations was by Martin Warnke himself. And he looked at the popularization of art historical literature in other words, the public face of the discipline. Not its elitism, but what it actually did when it did engage with the public. So he considered literature of the kind that I'm showing you here, Reklamhefte, the so-called blue books, as you see in the lower right-hand corner, um, popular art historical literature. And he looked at only the ones that were either republished or newly published after the Second World War as a way of saying that these things aren't just a continuation, but are a matter of current concern. He looked closely at the rhetoric and the metaphorics of this literature. And he started his talk by pointing out some, some of the worst examples of kitsch that one might imagine. But very quickly, he moved on to something that was much more dangerous. He moved on to point out extraordinary examples of militaristic, and one might be tempted to say, fascist rhetoric. And these were not only isolated examples, but seemed to color the whole tenor of this literature that was still being actively published. He pointed to phrases such as um, artworks where there was a, quote, rigorous subordination of the individual element in the interests of the whole. Um, they talked about strict discipline, stringency, coercion, incendiary passion, iron will, um, elements knowing their place, forces of order, decisive or violent suppressions of the subordinate, and so on. So he pointed, in other words, to the metaphorics of power, domination, subordination, compulsion, and discipline. And though he didn't name names, many of the authors were in the room at the time. The other dramatic paper was by Bertolt Hintz. Um, which considered the ideological appropriation of the so-called Bamberg um, Rider, an iconic piece of 12th century sculpture. Um, hadn't always been iconic. It turns out it was iconic from about 1900. Um, it was a relatively minor piece of sculpture, fairly clearly derived from figures um, that appear in Rams and Schalke, um, but came to become a symbol of everything that was German about German art. So the dependence on the French um, the precedence um, came to be a site where people could point out those huge differences, they said, between the French examples and the German ones. Um, there was plenty of kitsch, but also quite blood-curdling rhetoric in this material, still published after the war, um, where they speak about this figure with its clear, decisive gaze into the distance, towards the east, um, a, a gaze that expressed the sovereign drive of ex expansion, and so on. So in other words, pointing out this continuity of the Nazi rhetoric, the National Socialist rhetoric of Lebensraum, with a Cold War rhetoric. It was completely seamless. OK. Um, the discussion was highly emotional and quite bitter. Um, in particular, one scholar, Wolfgang Schöne, the author of some of these volumes, um, recognized the passages that he'd written. He responded. He tried trivializing, explaining away defending his work, then dismissing the charges, attacking the approach, and then later on he tried bullying. He wrote a letter to Varnke saying, quote, with the unbelievably dirty methods of your paper, you have in my judgment left the area of scholarship for the field of pseudo-academic demagogy of an ultra-left sort and a slanderous and defaming nature, end quote. He also threatened um, through himself and other emissaries legal action uh, against this poor young scholar. Okay, the issue was a matter of a certain kind of non-simultaneity. 
the presence in a democratic society of art historians in positions of quite considerable power um, who had been national socialists. Um, there was Wolfgang Schöne. Um, this was one of the books that he wrote. He's in the picture at the left, um, up at the top with the glasses. This is the actual founding of the Art Historical Association in 1948. Um, there were also people like Hubert Schrader, who wrote the book um, Buildings of the Third Reich, and really was a nasty character. Um, entered the SA, the Sturmabteilung, in 1933, the Nazi Party in 1937, when they finally let other people in. Um, so someone who seamlessly went into a chair in Tübingen in 1954. And then there's the case of Hans Zedelmeier, who was a Nazi when it was still illegal to be a Nazi in um, Austria. Um, a, an extremely um, enthusiastic follower of Hitler. Um, and what the young art historians actually hadn't uncovered at the time um, were bits of evidence such as this with Hans Zedelmeier's um, Hitler greetings. Um, things like that that they were beginning to discover but actually had been unaware of even when they had this session. Okay, so this was a culture that wasn't considered just privileged but fundamentally and completely poisoned. And they were scandalized by the slowness of art history to address this. And these matters had become addressed a little bit earlier in other disciplines. Now these might seem like matters that would be passed over in silence by the rest of Germany, but they were a scandal. Sorry, that's another figure. These were reported on. This um, session was reported on um, as showing art history in crisis by the National Die Welt. Um, it made it into Der Spiegel here, um, art history. Um, and there's very bold hints, scandal for the history of art. These things were public scandals even though they were matters of university scholars because of the highly politicized nature of university life. Now, there were other ways that things were quite foreign in Germany at the time. Um, Berger probably had to deal with little more than people choosing not to watch him. But after this, in 1972, there were laws passed in Germany that were called the Radikalen Erlass, or the laws against radicals um, that made it possible for political radicals, members of legal parties, but considered radical, um, to be fired from the civil service or not hired. And this also had a profound effect on the discipline. There are four major figures in the discipline who had trouble because of this, who either lost their jobs or were not allowed to um, continue them. A very different situation from the English one. Now, the last thing I want to mention um, is the role of émigré art historians in this moment, because the issue of the émigrés is folded into this event that I've been focusing on in fascinating but ultimately ambivalent ways. Now, the refugees from Hitler, who were art historians, um, changed the field in the UK, in the US, and in other countries. And their disappearance from Germany created the preconditions for the generation of full professors in history of art who were still in their places in 1970. So these emigres had actually opened up these possibilities for them. In his introduction to the published version of this conference, Varnke writes about it in no uncertain terms. This wasn't actually part of the session, but part of the book. Quote, it might seem that a cause is taking itself more seriously here than it objectively should. In fact, a certain anachronism is undeniable. When quite clever people are now beginning to say that the unrelenting calls for enlightenment are getting tedious, the history of art, still in its long state of self-imposed knowledge, begins to look up to date. It's quite a Dornian um, sort of turn of phrase. The abdication of enlightened impulses can only help a discipline that has long since ceased to respond to such views, most of all since the field relinquished its rational and critical spirit through the emigration of its best representatives during the 1930s. This bloodletting cannot, for the best will in the world, be put right, but the corpse left behind can be inspected in the report of this session." End quote. Okay, he did not mince his words. His way of addressing the issue of the emigres 
um, was to insist that his session be run with one of them. Um, and I'm drawing here on an interview um, that was carried out by my colleague Mechtel Fend, who's in the audience, who spoke to Martin Varnke quite recently, and this has also been published in another interview um, just now. Varnke wanted to involve an emigre. He obviously had many to choose from. There were many emigre art historians um, available. Interestingly, he chose the figure in the middle here, Leopold Ettlinger. Now, Ettlinger was, um, interesting from our perspective, I think, the Durning Lawrence Chair in the History of Art at UCL. Um, he is the person who took that chair away from the Slade um, and formed a proper academic department around it. He had held out in Halle in Germany until 1937 and then came to the UK and suffered all of the indignities that refugees did. Internment, working in fields that weren't his own, having to work for projects such as a popular volume on Christmas cards that he wanted nothing to do with, and so on. He co-chaired the session. In the session, he was very supportive of the young art historians and dismissive of the people who were objecting to what they had just heard. He also gave a paper at the session called um, Art History as History, Kunstgeschichte als Geschichte. And it's a very subtle and very fine critique of the kind of art historiography that had held sway in the 1930s. Hegelian, Hegelian generalizing historiography that looked for internal causes and was easily instrumentalized by people who felt or wanted to assert that nations or peoples have spirits. OK, a critical essay. However, when he saw the scandal that had erupted around this session, he chose not to publish his contribution with it. He wanted nothing to do with this scandal, scandal and the highly visible reaction against um, the generation of art historians who had served um, under national socialism. And that, I think, is quite interesting in getting at the habitus of the emigrants, the way they dealt with the Nazi past quite differently. Many of them refused to return to Germany, but none of them wanted to create any sort of disturbance. None of them wanted to be closely allied with the student protesters or the younger generations. We see this again and again, and the situations are sometimes grotesque. There's um, Ettlinger's situation. There's the one that happened around Theodor Adorno when he called in the troops to remove occupying students from the Frankfurt Institute of social research. And there's also this figure, Otto von Simpson, a Jewish emigre who was brought back to Germany and held the chair in the Free University in Berlin, started out as a moderate reformer, but very quickly reacted very strongly against the student movement, um, joined what was called, and what is this? It's quite horrible, the Emergency <coughs> Association for, uh, for the Defense of a Free University. He called in the police when he was um, rector of the university to get rid of the students. He turned into a kind of establishment figure, despite his own background as someone who had been excluded. We see this again and again, and I think it is just a fascinating aspect of this habitus and the different sort of habitus um, of the um, different generations of art historians. OK, a few very brief final points. This organization, the Ulmer Verein, the Ulm Association, can't be seen in any sort of heroic light, at least not in its early years. Um, I'd mentioned that there was no clear identification of it with the student movement. In fact, for several years, they excluded students from involvement. And one has to say that it's a slightly younger generation than the founders, students, who are actually the driving force behind a more radical agenda um, in the art historical world. So not so much the generation of Warnke, but the generation of Wolfgang Kemp, um, Hans Ernst Mittig, and Horst Bredekamp. Um, OK, so there's that. There's also the issue of gender, which never seemed to have been addressed in the critique. And that's one of the strengths of um, Berger's critique. Uh, Warnke said in 1990, um, in 1970, no one, as far as I know, was thinking about the women, interestingly. Finally, I just want to conclude by pointing out that, pointing out the length 
of this very dark shadow in the art historical world in Germany. By a recent event around um, the figure of Erwin Panofsky, um, an emigre who taught in Princeton, Princeton Institute of Advanced Study, um, and went on to a, a, a br continued, in a way, a brilliant career. He died in 1968. And when he died, he thought that the Habilitationsschrift, the second dissertation um, that German scholars have had to write, to a certain extent still have to write, um, to get a proper chair, he thought that his Habilitation on Michelangelo from 1930 had been lost. He considered it lost, but it's recently been found. Here it is. It's a 300-page manuscript that was found in this safe. And it's somewhere around here, I think. <coughs> the Central Institute for Kunstgeschichte in Munich, the Central Institute for the History of Art. Among the papers of this figure, um, Ludwig Heidenreich. There were a lot of National Socialist Kunstschutz documents in this safe. This was Heidenreich's safe. He was involved with certain things um, that don't look good in hindsight in terms of during the Second World War. Um, he took up the mantle of Panofsky afterwards, but he had apparently had or held on to this manuscript, which he presumably found in the institute in Hamburg, where he taught after Panofsky. And he must have found it at some point during the 1930s. What we see here is Heidenreich hosting Panofsky, as Panofsky received the highest order um, given by the German government in 1967 for the Merit, the Order of Merit, which he insisted be given at the Central Institute, of which he was the head, so he was able to pass in this light. Um, but I think now we can realize that precisely as this was happening was the moment when he could, at the very latest, have returned that manuscript to his teacher. Thanks.